Thank you very much for your very warm welcome and invitation to um, come to your conference. It's a great pleasure to be with you. This is the first time I've been in, I guess, what is Central Europe. Um, the furthest I've been otherwise is sort of all the bits that all the tourists go to um, in terms of France and Spain and Germany. So it's a, good, it's a great pleasure to be with you. Um, I brought my English copy of Watch with me um, uh, because it's a, a great book and I'm pleased that you've translated it into Slovenian and I look forward to the launch of that. But as a gift from St. Christopher's to um, you, I brought a copy of the most recent biography of Cicely Saunders written by David Clark, um, which was launched in 2018. I had the, um, the pleasure of organising the book launch for it, so I know quite what organising a book launch is like. It takes quite a bit of doing to get people to come, and even more to get people to speak about the book. Um, we, we really struggled with that. But it's signed by our chief executives, um, uh, Heather Richardson and Sean O'Leary, as a gift to you uh, from St Christopher's in London. So that's for you. What I'd like to talk about today, there we are, is this. So something about the development of care for the dying in early Christian communities. Uh, and then to think about the dying during the period of the Enlightenment. So in that period of the 16th, 17th, 18th century, as advances in medicine and science began to uh, uh, come about, what happened to care for the dying? What changed? And we'll then think about the later developments of hospice, uh, and I'll say a few words about Watch With Me, the book, and then talk also about the modern hospice uh, founded by Cicely Saunders. It's very easy to get to think that the hospice movement began in 1960 or 67 with St Christopher's. But it's very important always to remember that hospices have a very long and a very important part in the development of care for the dying. Particularly among Christian communities, but as you'll see also among other communities. And this particular piece of work uh, in caring for dying people is something which had, at the earliest stage, a very strong religious element to it. And it's important that we recognise that. So, important to remember that for the first Christians who wanted to um, organise into uh, groups to do things for others, they took this biblical precedent from Matthew 25, what are generally called the Dominical Commands, the Commands of our Lord. And he told people to feed, the, uh, feed those who are hungry, to clothe the naked, to visit the prisoners, um, uh, to give water to those who are thirsty. Uh, and that became a very uh, fundamental part of early Christian communities' life amongst themselves and as a way as early Christian communities of showing the, who they were without saying who they were, by living their faith, uh, by following these commands of Jesus. So this formed a first step for the men and women who began to form early communities in thinking about how we care for others. Jesus told us to go and do these things. But what they also recognised, of course, was that there was more to it than that. So where Jesus ended with the words, and the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me they saw that there was something missing, essentially. And what was missing was a care of those who were dying. So they added in um, the idea that they would also care for those who were dying amongst them as part of that holistic care. Today, of course, we talk about holistic care, as we'll see later on in this uh, uh, presentation, as being um, cared by uh, multi-professional uh, workers, doctors and nurses, social workers, psychologists, chaplains, religious orders, um, volunteers. But initially, of course, the whole process of doing this work began amongst these small communities. Um, and it's important to remember that they were small communities. We, we're not talking about the American megachurches of six or 7,000 people. We're talking about small groups of Christians gathered together who would care for each other and for others. So in following the dominical command to welcome the stranger and care for the sick, to feed the hungry, to give the thirsty something to drink, to clothe the poor and to visit prisoners, they added the need and the wish to care for those who are dying. And that is the start, if you like, of where hospices began. And Christian communities continued that 
in a very um, ad hoc arrangement, a, a sort of an informal way. They just did this because they were told to do it. This is our work. This is our life. Um, until Emperor Constantine came along in 312. And for those of you that have studied church history, you will realise that he stamped his boot upon the Christian church and it was never the same again. Um, everything changed, essentially, when the Roman Empire was Christianized under Constantine. I know that there were moments of backwards and forwards for a long time after Constantine's death between emperors, uh, but fundamentally he made a big difference to the church. And he commanded the church, uh, a, an, an emperor's command, to systematically care for the sick by an imperial edict. And so they were told that they would set up infirmaries or hospices, which they could open as um, uh, churches. Now that um, uh, state um, approval made a huge difference to the way in which the churches then set out their work. And by 312, you'll know um, that churches were beginning to be much more organized. They were meeting in basilicas or uh, organized places. And so the natural de of development was under um, Emperor Constantine that they would then begin to really make a move. As I said a moment ago, Constantine was just one of a string of Roman emperors, one of a huge string. And so following him was the Emperor Julian, he decided he wasn't a Christian, as um, uh, Constantine was, but he was a pagan. He wanted to follow the pagan gods, um, but he didn't think that actually ceasing care of the dying was a good thing. So he told the pagan priests to do exactly the same, to establish hospices, or xenodokia, so that Christians would not excel us in good deeds. Now, there's nothing quite like a bit of competition and competition is what you got. So if you can imagine Christian communities and the pagan communities both doing good deeds for those who are least able to help themselves and taking into themselves men and women who were dying, reaching the end of life at a much earlier stage of life, of course, than we are used to, but they were coming to that point of, of dying and therefore they were commanded to do it. So we take a lot of our words, or a lot of our, the, the usage of words um, in hospice care, from a very early Latin root. So hospitium, a word for hospitality, becomes the root for hospice. It's a place of community and hospitality. It's the word that gives us that, hospitality. It also gives us hospital, as well as it gives us hospice. We also took the word palliative, palliative from the Latin of pallium, to cloak. And essentially, of course, that's used more in terms of medical care. That medicine, the use of drugs, will cloak symptoms so that a, a person can have a better quality of life. I think that's um, only to answer part of the question about the use of palliative or pallium, because clearly someone who gives spiritual care or religious care or social care or emotional care or time with a person um, someone who is just willing to sit and hold somebody's hand is cloaking other things in their life. At that point, is offering palliative care. And the, uh, the term uh, pallium comes from Martin of Tours, whose picture um, is up there. I, I googled um, Martin of Tours, uh, looking for a photograph of him, and I've never seen quite so many photographs of one man. Um, all of which, in some way, show him cutting his cloak in half and giving it to the beggar at the road. So Martin was um, a Roman centurion, and he uh, was dissatisfied with his life, and he met this beggar at the gate who begged him for warmth, and so Martin uh, cut his um, uh, ro cloak in half and gave him half, and that's where we get this phrase of pallium uh, from, to cloak. Uh, um, uh, yeah. So in the Western model, we have the development of the early years of um, a, a hospice or a place of safety, a place of care for the dying. Um, but over time, the church split, as we know, from an Eastern church and a Western church. And so Fabiola, the Empress Fabiola in the fourth century, took the Eastern model to infirmaries, uh, of infirmaries to Rome after a pilgrimage that she had made to Jerusalem. So she began again, because of her position in the, in the state, to develop and to make it them better known in other places. 
uh, and Fabiola had a role in, in sort of um, disseminating or showing others what a hospice, a place for those who were dying, could be like. And as religious orders began to be founded, both monasteries and convents, uh, abbeys uh, and the like, the uh, care of the dying began to move from the community into very much more structured settings. So a monastery or a convent or an abbey, which was very often set on the road of a pilgrimage, would have a place for those who would stay the night. They would have a, um, a hospitium, somewhere that people would stay. And for some people who were traveling on pilgrimage, those places became a place to die. Um, it wasn't quite like for me getting on a plane at Heathrow on yesterday afternoon and landing in uh, Zagreb. Travel was a bit more difficult, although if you travel with British Airways, you'll realize just how difficult they are. Um, uh, it is an experience traveling with BA. Um, but it became something which was taken into the organized church rather than being something that was roots, uh, in the roots of the people. And understandably, of course, that happens over time. Things become ordered and organized, and things become routinized, because we have a, a way in which we do that naturally. So it's kept the care of the dying, and those who were on pilgrimage, or those who are living in the community locally, would move into these places, because that was an established role. That was part of their life. And for centuries... Um, the uh, monks and nuns uh, uh, and uh, those who were in religious orders carried out a real care for the dying using the skills and the abilities that they had. Now that was remarkable, that here was a place where dying wasn't going to happen um, away from a community of faith, uh, away from a place, a community of others, and away from a community where you knew that you would be cared for to the very best of someone's ability. And of course, early religious communities took this up very strongly. So the rule of St. Benedict um, took up Matthew 25, which we saw uh, very early on, as a founding principle of care for others. It was the command of our Lord, the command of Jesus himself, a dominical command. And therefore, for Benedict, it was important that his people followed it. So he said, all guests are to be received as Christ himself. For he said, I was a stranger, hospes fui and you welcomed me. Now, we'll come on to talk about the modern hospice in a little while, but for Cicely Saunders, there was something very strongly in those sorts of words that moved her deeply to found the modern hospice movement. It moved her deeply to do that. And according to Cicely herself, Dr. Saunders herself, they cared for these communities as an integral part of their mission. It was who they were. And it happened because the medical profession, who adhered to a Hippocratic oath, did not care for the incurable dying as, co as it was contrary to the will of the gods. So what they did, of course, was always, as medics do, because that's their oath, they, looked, they sought to cure people. They sought to make them well. So those who came into the religious orders or the religious houses found that that wasn't the case, that they could be cared for to the point of death. And in England, and I use the word England very carefully because the United Kingdom is a very modern construct. Um, it only arrived really in the 18th century. Um, so in England, which was most of our history, St. Thomas's Hospital and St. Bartholomew's, St. Bartholomew's Hospital, two very big institutions in central London, which were founded in the 12th century, um, uh, were subject to a petition after the dissolution of the monasteries to carry on trying to care for those who were dying. When the Reformation came in England, because Henry VIII no longer wanted to be married to the wife that he was married to, because he wanted to be married to somebody else, um, because he liked her better, to put it nicely, um, uh, he, of course, sought a dissolution of his marriage, uh, an annulment of his marriage from the Pope, uh, and the Pope refused to give it. But his wife, of course, being uh, the niece, the, the aunt, I think, of the Holy Roman Emperor, was in a very strong position. And uh, the Holy Roman Emperor had a quiet word with the Pope, and the Pope uh, refused. Um, so he dissolved, so in, in leaving the Church of Rome, he dissolved the monasteries um, and saw their wealth as a way of uh, enriching the coffers of the state. So after he dissolved the monasteries, and it didn't take very long for that to happen, um, 
those organisations that had been in, in central London, St Thomas's and St Bartholomew's as hospitals, they petitioned to be allowed to continue to care for the dying. Uh, but they were lost, ultimately, to travellers and to others in the period. There was nowhere else for them to go. And right across the country, there are now ruins or barely any ruins left of monasteries and convents that were destroyed at the end of the Reformation. Uh, and that was a complete change for the way in which dying people were cared for. Um, and this is partly why um, the secular medical profession didn't um, continue the role of the, of the religious communities. Their ethos and their life was different. They wanted to do care for the living, not cure for the living rather, not care for the dying. And that change meant that dying was seen as a failure in the eyes of the medical profession. And it's remained that way ever since. Uh, for those of you that have an elderly relative, maybe in their late 80s or early 90s, who has a number of comorbidities, you will find that your doctors will try and treat every single one of them individually without taking a holistic look at the person they are, have in front of them because they want to cure that disease or at least enable that disease to be held back for as long as possible. There is very little conversation which says, just right now you have all these things wrong with you. Have you thought about the end of your life? So the Reformation made a huge difference around cure of the living and not care of the dying. And as you can see on the screen, medicine began to research and discover cures. It was an amazing period, and it still is an amazing period. Previously incurable diseases found a way in which they could be dealt with and cured. Edward Jenner found the cure for smallpox, not in an easy way by any means. Um, you know, it, it took him a while to do it, and it wasn't particularly pleasant on his subjects. John Snow in London uh, found what caused cholera, uh, that it was borne by the water that people were drinking. Uh, and in central London now, in Soho, uh, there is a pub um, named after Jon Snow, and there is the um, fountain at which he made his discovery. Um, and interestingly, in the last few years, that fountain, which was supposed to be in the place where he had uh, made his discovery, was moved across the road. So clearly it was a, it was a movable feast, wherever it was supposed to be. And pharmacology and surgery began to advance. Um, and people would work on cadavers to understand what disease was, to know how it could be cured. And that made a big difference then to sideline what it meant to die. Dying wasn't part of the process. Dying was um, a problem that happened if you weren't able to cure somebody. And that's a big, big thing. So uh, the autopsies were carried out to understand anatomy and disease. And the dead essentially became a teaching aid for those who were alive. Um, and uh, we had a period in, in the UK or in Britain of grave robbers who would steal cadavers or corpses and sell them to medical schools and to individuals who wanted to do autopsies. Um, it's not a particularly great thing that we did, or they did. Um, but this was the way in which medicine was thinking in a different, a different model to that which had gone before. So dying was an inconvenience for the doctor. It was no longer part of the lifespan. Even though, of course, um, the lifespan was relatively short in comparison to today. Um, my PhD, my doctorate, is on early Methodist, um, uh, the early Methodist movement, so the very earliest part of the um, 18th century. And um, I spent a lot of time in libraries, which was great, um, looking at early letters written by Methodists to other Methodists. And their experience of death was really quite significant. Death in childbirth, death of children who were stillborn, or death of children in early age, and dying young through industrial accidents because Britain was beginning to industrialise, or through other diseases. So um, uh, death was all around the people who lived a normal life. It just was no longer cared for in the way that it had been previously. So there was nothing and no one doing the work that the monasteries and abbeys and convents had previously done. So, is there any cure for this in terms of looking differently at what it means to die? And I'm pleased to say there is. And it came through this woman, Mother Mary Aikenhead. In the 19th century, 
um, she came along and recognized that there was a way in which monasteries and convents, places of um, religious orders, had had a, had a really remarkable life in the past to look after people. So the first modern hospice of the 19th century was founded uh, by Jean Garnier, uh, who founded one in Lyon, in France. Um, and that was the first time really they used hospice in relation to care of the dying. It was the first time they chose to use that word properly. And then from the Sisters of Charity in Ireland, uh, Mother Mary Aikenhead founded St. Margaret's Hospice in Cork and then St. Joseph's Hospice in London. St. Luke Joseph's Hospice in London uh, still exists. It is the oldest hospice in Britain. Uh, and it was founded by the sisters to care for the poor who were dying in East London, who were Irish immigrants into London who had come to um, build the railways. So they were predominantly Catholic, and they were predominantly um, uh, uh, men uh, who came sometimes with their families, sometimes without. But they, when they came to die, they had nowhere. And so Mary Aikenhead, Mother Mary, um, chose to open a second hospice in London, and that continued its work um, until today. Although it's changed its, its, uh, its model, it still continues. And I'll say a bit more about St. Joseph's because it's very important for Sicily's work. There was also St. Luke's Methodist Hospital, which followed on something of that. And in Clapham, in southwest London, there was an organisation called the Hostel of God, which was founded in the late 19th century uh, by an Anglican order of nuns. Uh, and that still exists now. It's called Trinity Hospice instead. Um, but they cared for the dying as a place of refuge. It was a place of last resort. When you couldn't be looked after by your family anymore or you had no one at all, these hospices took you in. They, they took you and they cared for you to the point of dying. What they offered you in terms of pain relief, in terms of social care, was uh, limited. They offered you obviously the religious care of the church, um, in terms of the Ars Moriunde, the good death, but they didn't offer you much more than that and weren't able to. That wasn't their ethos. It wasn't what they chose to do. And then along came Dame Cicely Saunders, who really made a bit of a difference to, uh, uh, to the hospice movement. So she considered that for many physicians, the term incurable was unacceptable and curative medicine was the primary role of medicine. So she carried out, she understood that enlightenment um, theme around medicine, that it was about curative treatment, the way in which I can make you better, not the way in which I can be with you as you die and help you die well. And so for her, the foundation of St. Christopher's Hospice was a protest against the medicalization of death. And I'll say a little bit more about that too later on. Other modern hospices in the UK, in Britain, didn't have the same founding theme. St. Christopher's was very unusual because Sicily was protesting against the way that doctors treated dying. By the time St. Christopher's was founded, and other people came to want to begin their own hospice wherever they were in, the, in Britain, they wanted to start it as part of a communitarian element, an effort. So usually a general practitioner with a nurse or someone from a local hospital wanted to get together to find a way in which they could support people who were dying in their own home. That's how most hospices began, rather than St. Christopher's, which began with a building. Um, but there was a different ethos to it. It wasn't a, medic a protest. It was about a supportive role that medicine and nursing could offer. So the modern hospice began outside the control of the NHS, um, and many hospices, in fact most hospices in Britain, remain outside the control of the NHS. There are only two or three that now receive a full funding from the National Health Service. Most hospices, hospices will receive some funding from our National Health Service. For us at St Christopher's that's about 30%, but our annual budget is £21 million. So the rest of that 21 million that isn't funded by the local NHS has to be fundraised by volunteers, by all kinds of things that happen um, across the course of the year. Legacies, uh, people doing jumps out of helicopters, running marathons, all sorts of stuff. So there is some funding for many hospices, but not a lot. And this is Cicely. I, I only knew her for the last seven months, oh, seven months of her life. 
Um, she died in uh, July 2005, um, and I began work at St. Christopher's before that. Um, but in her last month, she was a very pragmatic and very strong woman. Uh, it's the only word I can use for her. If she didn't like something that you said, she didn't need to say a word. She just needed to look at you. That tells you how she was. Um, she just needed to look at you. Um, and I sometimes said things to her that clearly told me I'd said the wrong thing. So she was born in 1918 into an upper middle class family uh, in north, into the north of London. And her career path was just amazing. She first trained as a nurse, um, despite the fact that because of her class, she would be expected to have just married and uh, lived the life of a, of a housewife. Um, because she wanted to do something to help, particularly during the war. That was the driver for her. She saw what was going on and she wanted to help. A back injury meant that she could no longer nurse uh, because she couldn't physically lift patients anymore. It is that age-old problem that nurses had, of course, um, before hoists really became common, that they would damage their backs, and that was her problem. So she re then retrained as a medical social worker um, and worked at St Thomas's Hospital in central London, and finally as a doctor, and I'll say a bit more about that um, in a moment. What is really significant for Dame Cicely Saunders is that moment in 1945. She was an individual who I think through her life was searching for a purpose or a cause. She wasn't someone who was willing just to take the status quo and be quiet and live quietly. She was looking for a way in which she could make a difference to the world and to herself. And so on holiday with some friends from her, her nursing uh, set, her nursing cohort, um, in Cornwall, um, she was in a tent and she uh, spoke to God, as she put it, and decided that that time to de dedicate her life to the work of God, to the work of Christ. And she said, show me what it is that I must do, pretty much. Um, and she lived with the tension of having de made this dedication to God and not knowing what that dedication would actually lead to. She didn't know what it would be. And it wasn't until 1948, when she met David Tajma, that I think she found the fit for her of what made that moment of conversion and dedication work for her. At the point of 1948, she was a medical social worker in hospital, and she met David Tajma on a busy hospital ward. What's commonly thought about him is that he was a Polish-Jewish refugee from the Warsaw Ghetto. David Clark, in his recent biography of her, has shown that he came to the UK before 1939, um, so it's thought that he wasn't from the Warsaw Ghetto. But what is known is that all his family perished in the, um, uh, during the war in various concentration camps. He worked as a waiter in a restaurant and he lived in a bedsit. And in 1948, as he was beginning to die in hospital, he met with Cicely, and clearly something between those two connected in a way that was much more than just um, a social worker-patient relationship. What he saw in her and she saw in him was a connection of two human beings in need. He thought that he would die with his life having meant nothing, having achieved nothing. And what she wanted to enable David Tajma to recognise was that his life did mean something. And so she recited the Psalms to him. She tried to remember parts of the Old Testament that might, he might be able to resonate with. She talked to him about her faith and what that meant. And what she saw in him was that he had to earn his pain relief and had no other support. So she saw that because he only received pain relief twice a day, 12 hours apart, he would have to wait for that moment when it came and that's what she described as earning the pain relief. And she wanted to find a way that things could be different. That they didn't just have lives that were isolated and lonely, and they were constantly in pain so they didn't have a good quality of life. She wanted to find a way in which a whole life could still be lived and celebrated and remembered. So eventually, um, after agitating doctors for years and years, a doctor said to her, Sicily, doctors will never listen to you unless you are a doctor. They'll only ever listen to each other. So she took that as a bit of a challenge, and she went off to medical school and trained as a doctor. Um, and some of the people that she trained with in her year eventually also went into the very earliest stages of um, palliative medicine. 
uh, Mary Baines in particular, who's still alive and lives very low, close to St. Christopher's, was the first doctor who came to start home care in 1969. So after qualifying as a doctor, she um, set out to um, understand how pain relief could be better given to, to enable a better quality of life. And so she received a scholarship to do her um, uh, re research. And this was long before the days of going off to ethical committees and asking for, for clear ethical um, permission to do stuff. Because if you look at what she did, she would never have got permission to do this. Um, she effectively experimented with morphine to create a way in which you would give your morphine main dose 12 hours apart, but then allow other smaller doses in four hourly intervals which meant that you could maintain a lower pain threshold, but a good quality of life. Um, and at the time, things like the Brompton cocktail were being used, but this was a completely different way of enabling pain relief to happen. And at the same time that she did that, she sat and talked with her patients, what our sister was talking about earlier today. She took the time to sit and talk to them. And she recorded verbatim numerous accounts of their lives and their living and how their life was, and how it had been, and how it was now. And when she approached St. Joseph's Hospice in North London uh, to, see, to see if she could um, spend some time with their patients, they were so afraid of what she proposed that they only let her have one patient until they were satisfied that she wasn't going to kill him. Um, uh, so clearly, you know, death even at that point was still a moot point. But they were very concerned that what she was doing was, was radical stuff. But in meeting the people at St. Joseph's and other places, she clearly came to understand the concept of total pain, uh, which we'll think about in the main tomorrow when I talk about spiritual distress. But she came to understand what total pain was from a medical, a nursing, uh, a social, an emotional, and a psychological um, setting. And in 67, St. Christopher's opened. She'd fundraised for it. She bought the land in southeast London. Um, she'd written up a thing called The Scheme, um, and then that describes very carefully what she wanted St. Christopher's to be, uh, and who she wanted to work there, and what she wanted it to be like. And because nobody knew what a hospice should look like, um, uh, she built a hospital. So it looks like a hospital. It's on four floors, and it looks like a hospital. Modern hospices now, I'm sure, in Slovenia or in any other country, as in the UK, are generally built on one level with the patients' rooms looking out onto gardens. So there's some very nice um, environment for them. For most of our patients, they get to look out on a, on a, on a main road and a bus route, um, which isn't quite so nice. But at the same time as Cicely was doing her work and her thinking, she found that she was invited more and more to America to talk to Americans uh, about their thinking around um, the end of life. And um, significantly, she met Florence Wald and Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Uh, and together, they were thinking about what can we do to help dying people die better or die well or die with a completed life, which I think is an important way to put it. So she had a lot of contacts through her life with um, America and American systems. Um, although this is an aside, um, when Cicely Saunders died, she had to her name 24 honorary doctorates. Now that shows just how significant the work that she undertook was. And she received the last doctorate from Bath University about a month before she died. Um, at St. Christopher's. So there was something about what she did that meant universities themselves wanted to recognise that particular achievement um, in their, um, in their uh, thinking. And I want us to think about now um, opportunities and challenges before we then think about um, watch with me and then go back to some more opportunities and challenges. The first thing to remember, of course, that the modern hospice is not just a model of care. It's much more than that. If we only see something as a model, that's looking at something only from a constructivist um, uh, way of, look, of working and living. For Sicily and for those who work in the hospice, we should see hospice as a philosophy of care. It has to be much deeper than something which is just a way of doing. It is a way of being. It is about embodying something to other people. 
Um, and so it depends on the communication of ideas and of attitudes from the doctors at the top, who might be the medical director or the consultants, down to the orderlies who come in to clean a room in the morning, everybody shares the same philosophy of support and care. Nobody is there just because they are doing a job. Everybody is there because they are there to support those who are dying and their families. Of course, there's been a worldwide development of palliative care, but a major concern still remains the availability of morphine, in some countries where it's not available at all or in other places where it's available only on a limited supply. Uh, so those issues still stand um, as a challenge. And I think the World Health Organization have done a lot to try to enable um, morphine and other uh, pain relieving drugs to be made available as appropriate. And the philosophy for Sicily is founded upon patient care and it's supported by research and education. And it's that which makes modern hospice what it is. It isn't that it's simply caring for dying people and enabling them to die well. It is to con constantly review and renew the model that you are looking at and understanding the philosophy that you have on a much deeper level. So all the time, as you are today over this conference and tomorrow, thinking about, uh, through education, how you can support those who are reaching the end of life in uh, nursing and care homes and other supportive environments. So the same is true for hospice care in itself. We have to constantly seek to think about what we do more and more for an ageing population. How do we do more for those who have long-term conditions, and very often multiple long-term conditions, with which they will live for a number of years and maybe die from uh, one of those when it becomes overwhelming? How do we support people who have cancer, uh, who have dementia rather, uh, over and above the traditional idea that only hospices only support people with cancer? How do we enable um, everyone in the local community to have a part in feeling comfortable and able to talk about death, dying and loss as a normal part of living, not as something which is just an abhorrence? Um, at St Christopher's now I run a death cafe. You may have heard of death cafes and what they do. Um, but it gets people together to talk about death, dying and loss. And because we run it at a, in a hospice, we want people to really come along to talk about um, bereavement, and how bereavement affects people, and what, bereavement, what difference bereavement makes to people. Um, we also, as you'll hear from Pyotr later on, are thinking around compassionate communities um, through the things that we are doing to enable local communities to have resilience uh, in supporting each other and supporting themselves when the time comes to, um, uh, to face the end of life. And for us, as for every other hospice, the concept of total pain embodies the nature of hospice care. It's remarkable that I work in an environment where what I offer as a chaplain into that environment is as valued and as important as that which our medical director offers with his expertise. That together with social workers, uh, with um, uh, therapists, in art and music and other disciplines, uh, with nurses, uh, with uh, a variety of staff, we sit together in a multi-professional setting to help support people at the end of their life, however long that life may be. Um, and the model of total pain within that really, really matters. So we might talk about total pain not as something which is physical, but as something which is deeply emotional or spiritual, that their pain is not being able to talk to their family not being able to express what it is that troubles them most, not feeling that their life has been complete, um, having a sense that no one will remember me, rather like David Tajma, uh, the very first person that she met. Nobody will remember me. What on earth is going to become of me? But those things matter in a multi-professional setting. And I think, again, in opportunities and challenges, this picture... It's not a, the brightest of pictures, I'm sorry. This picture is our ambulance bay. So every patient who comes into St Christopher's is, is received at the ambulance bay. And until recently, we had a tradition that they were always met at the ambulance bay by a person, one of the nursing staff, from the ward on which they were going to be uh, going. That stopped because um, the nurses themselves found that they didn't want to do that anymore. They began to say, we don't want to do this. We can't be released from the ward work. So that stopped. But this is a patient being received into the hospice um, as they are every day, 
Um, uh, and um, it's one of those really important things that they're given a warm welcome into a very different environment. Palliative care became a specialty for medicine in the 1980s, and I'm not one who can say whether that was a good thing or a bad thing, but what Sicily began as a protest against the medicalization of death, the doctors eventually took back. Um, there seems to be something ironic about that somehow, that you know what was taken from them, they took back. Um, and what I find now is that many of our junior doctors coming through to us are trained in such a secular environment in their medical training that they have very little understanding of the holistic model of care. It takes a long time for them to really get that hospice care is about everybody who works there doing something which helps the patient and their family. Um, in an environment which, where you're trained in a very secular way, just about medicine and curative medicine, it's a very different thing. The NHS themselves, of course, and the CQC, the Care Quality Commission, which is our regulatory body, um, they are increasingly concerned about the provision of end-of-life care, and they are e equally concerned about it being of quality. Um, now, that's not to say that people's dying in the past was not of quality. Um, it simply means that they want to be able to show uh, uh, that it is of quality. So we now have stakeholders that we have to um, uh, give reports to that talk about the um, the number of deaths that we have, the number of patients that we have, uh, the, the way in which we use our staff and resources so that we can record these things. We know that we have an ageing population um, and there's some good research undertaken by the Sicily Saunders Institute which shows that death rates will increase in the UK um, until 2030. And the same is true across Europe. And I think that comment around the 21st century being the age of the elderly is absolutely right. With um, uh, decreasing birth rates uh, and an increasingly elderly population, the oldest old are becoming a very significant part of the population as a whole. Um, we are no longer living, uh, no longer dying young or dying in middle age. We are dying not just in old age, but in old, old age. And the oldest old in society are beginning to form quite a significant number of our communities. And people are living longer with a lot of complexity. People aren't simply dying of one disease anymore. They are living with multiple comorbidities, which means that medics are very often managing a number of different things. And how hospices, the modern hospice, responds to that is a challenge. Because how do you have somebody coming into a hospice setting as an outpatient or as a patient in the community or in the hospice who won't die soon? and therefore you can't keep in the hospice for very long. So they go back to the community, and you might discharge them from your books um, so that they then come back later on when they need you again. So how do we deal with complexity in a modern hospice setting when people are living longer? And hospice care in the UK, and I'm sure for you where in your um, setting, has always been very clearly associated with cancer. I do not know why this is the case. The first patient that came to St Christopher's before we opened in 1967 uh, and was admitted to the ward had motor neurone disease. And she lived in St Christopher's for two years before she died. So we have never, never just been about cancer, but it's what we became famous for. And it's how we break out as a modern opportunity um, from saying we just care for people who are dying of, of, a, of a malignancy to say we care for people who are dying because they are dying and they deserve to die well, and they deserve to die having had a complete life. I'd like to talk a bit now, if it's all right, about Watch With Me, which I know I've thrown on the floor. Um, uh, watch With Me. Because I was asked just to... Oh, yes, I'll pick it up. Um, asked to mention this in my talk, and I know that you're going to um, launch it this evening. But this is a, a, a really... It's a lovely book. When I came to St. Christopher's to be interviewed for the job which I uh, had, of uh, then chaplain, now spiritual care lead, I was asked to do a 15-minute presentation. And I was um, uh, a bit stunned as to what I would do. I had no idea what I would do. And so one of the books that I managed to find uh, was Watch With Me, along with some other things. So I talked about what I thought that the role of a chaplain should be in a, in a hospice in 2005. Um, and using some of this book, I managed to wangle my way to get a job, and I've been there ever since. 
But watch with me is this. It's a collection of writings which spans Sicily's life and experiences of working with dying people. What we get from her in four pieces of writing, which were originally delivered as lectures, is her reflection, her thinking back about what it means to have done the job that she has done in different contexts. And you can see the way in which they were written um, from 1965, before St. Christian was opened, through to 2003, which was about uh, Consider Him. And watch with me, of course, you may be familiar with the phrase, uh, is of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, as he himself was going off to pray, and he asked his disciples to watch with me. Um, and the very last um, uh, talk which she gave, Consider Him, uh, was really about her life of faith, how her faith had grown and deepened and developed over the years. Cicely Saunders was an Anglican, a member of the Church of England, um, and um, uh, rather than have a church which she went to, uh, she built a hospice with a chapel, and the chapel in St Christopher's became her church. So Sunday by Sunday and weekday events, she would join patients and families and members of staff uh, to um, celebrate communion, the Eucharist, um, to have services of the word, um, but that became her place of worship. Um, and so she didn't have, in a sense, a fixed religious community that was hers and which offered her support. She created this very mobile, um, uh, transient community uh, of people who were coming through the hospice for a limited period of time. Um, and in that, um, she found a real sense of, of her own purpose, I think. So the themes which she looked at... Um, primarily through her book, are her work as a nurse, which I think was a big foundational piece of, uh, of work for her. Her meeting of David Tajma, which we cannot actually underestimate. Whether he was a refugee from the Warsaw Ghetto doesn't matter. What really matters is the influence that he had on her when he met her. Uh, there are two other Polish men that she met in her life that influenced her. One was Anthony Mishinovich, who was a patient at St. Joseph's Hospice before 1967 and who she clearly says she fell in love with, uh, and she was quite upfront about that, um, and recognised actually the pain of bereavement when he died. Um, and also then her husband, um, Marian Bohutsisko, who was um, uh, uh, also Polish and who had come across to the England um, and was working as a, as a teacher and an artist. And so St Christopher's, when I arrived, was full of his artwork. Um, if you're married to the chief executive of a hospice, um, you get to put your art wherever you like, I think. And he really made the most of it. It covered the walls. Um, but meeting David Tashma for her through Watch With Me, you will see, was so significant that she saw in this man whose life felt what he, he felt was not complete or did not matter, she simply wanted him to have a sense that his life had made a difference. There was a sense in which there was a legacy to leave behind. And one of the fundamental things for us as human beings is that sense of leaving a legacy, leaving something that other people will remember. And for David Tajma, that was leaving her about £500 in his will to be a window in your home. And if you ever come to St Christopher's, the window is in what was originally our reception room, uh, which is now our, uh, another teaching room uh, named after Sicily. But it remembers him that his life was not worthless or without value, but that he was the springboard for all that has come on since. She then talks about her development of St Christopher's in its role of care and research and education, and she was <clears throat> keen to employ Tom West, Dr Tom West, to do the first piece of research around the use of morphine and diamorphine, um, and also education generally, and not education that was about academia, but education that was about enabling people who were working in the hospices or in hospitals in other settings to actually be able to understand how they themselves could care for people. It's very easy to end up setting up an academic institution um, when actually for St Christopher's and for Sicily, the life, of the, the life of the hospice was what drove the education of the hospice how we care for people, how we support them, what we do for them in bereavement, all of those things mattered. And then there's the um, development of total pain, which she saw, as I described very briefly earlier, um, physical and spiritual, emotional and social pain, that came through the, um, the work that she did between qualifying as a doctor and opening St Christopher's. 
for Sicily, that period, I think, was absolutely foundational around the, the model of total pain. That she realised that medicine alone uh, was not enough. Pain was not simply something which you experienced physically, but you experienced it all through you. So the patient who said to her, um, and we'll look at this tomorrow with spiritual pain, first of all, doctor, it started in my arm, but now it's all over. She knew when she was told that, that what, she was being talk what was being talked about wasn't a pain in her arm alone. It was a pain in her spirit, in her emotions, in her heart. It was absolutely everywhere for her. Um, and that's why I think in terms of multi-professional working, social work, alongside chaplaincy, alongside medicine and nursing, alongside our art and music psychotherapists, alongside our well-being team, alongside cognitive behavioural therapy, um, uh, and all kinds of other things which we now have, are set up to enable people to um, work through this idea of total pain in the most useful way for them. It's clear, I think, in, in the 21st century that we've pretty much got our medicine and nursing right. But people suffer. And that, I think, is where we still fall, fall very short. We fall short in helping somebody with their suffering. And we fall short because we cannot bear to see others suffer or join in with their suffering or enable, them, or enable ourselves to sit with them while they suffer. Sometimes we, have, we feel we have to have an answer. We have to be able to say, this is what I can do for you. We're much less able now to be able to say, I can't help you with that, but I can be with you. And that's a, that's a complex thing. Well, there's, there are a couple of patients I'll talk about tomorrow for whom that was absolutely what they needed. They didn't need pain relief. They didn't need good nursing care, which they were getting. They needed someone to hear them in the same way that David Tajman needed someone to recognize that his life mattered. And he was okay. He was a human being. And then, of course, there is Cicely's personal experience of faith. It drove her, I think is the only word I can use for it. Her belief system drove her. When she made her commitment of faith in 1945 in a tent in Cornwall, she was on a mission to find her mission. And it was uh, a Polish man in uh, a hospital in central London that finally gave her that mission, that fulfilled it for her. And that's what took her through the rest of her life. So her personal experience of faith really mattered. I've said a lot about him, but he comes up a lot in the sense that he cannot be left out. Um, so he was a waiter. And I think Cicely's words there from, from her writing, um, the most important thing was for him to find somebody who would listen. He was dying at the age of 40. It made no difference to the world that he'd, never, that he'd ever lived in it. That, I think, is fundamental to all the work we do for caring for people in a hospice, in a long-term setting, in a hospital setting, wherever it is, that we enable people to recognise they have mattered and their life has had value and purpose. We're doing a lot more now at St Christopher's around legacy work for people who are dying. And that, I think, is an important thing to hold in your minds if you are setting up long-term care. How can people leave behind them, through the work that you do with them, some sort of legacy? whether that's through art or music, through writing or biography, through narrating a story, something which leaves behind the story of my life, the story of myself. And he then left her, as I said, money to be a window in her home. They didn't know what a hospice would be like. They called it, he called it a home, but that's all that they knew. And it was all about him being recognised, that he would finally have a place in the world um, and actually have a place where he mattered most. And I really think this is important. I mean, I'll read this but, um, because it's in English. But this is fundamental from being there. Watch with me means still more than all our learning of skills, our attempts to understand mental suffering and loneliness, and to pass on what we have learned. It means also a great deal that cannot be understood. The words did not mean understand what is happening when they were first spoken. Still less did they mean explain or take away. There will always be the place where we'll have to stop and know that we are really helpless. Even when we feel we can do absolutely nothing, we will still have to be prepared to stay. Watch with me means, above all, just be there. 
I remember the patient who said of the people who had really helped her, they never let you down, they just keep on coming. And watch with me is embodied in that. And I think end of life care in any setting is embodied in that. We have some amazing skills in our medical profession and in our nursing profession and in social work and chaplaincy and health, other healthcare and allied health professions. But at some point, people simply want you to be with them and to sit with them. I reflected a while ago with a colleague that I've never worked anywhere that I've spent so much time holding the hands of elderly gentlemen. And there's something quite significant on that as I reflected that here are men who in their life would never have been someone who showed any emotion or any sense of wanting someone to come alongside them other than to give them something and to do something, who as they come to the end of their life simply want someone to be with them and to, in being with them, to physically make some contact with them so they know they are not alone. In the West, we live in a very... Uh, isolated society. We live almost as autonomous individuals in a society of autonomous individuals. Communities are hard to develop and hard to find. Um, and that for us was partly caused by one of our prime ministers in the past, Margaret Thatcher, who decided that there is no such thing as society. And she said that very publicly, there is no such thing as society. Um, but uh, people coming to the end of their life need to feel a human connection one to another. And if I'm sitting with somebody and I'm holding their hand and we're saying nothing, nothing, it isn't that nothing is happening. It isn't that suddenly I'm doing nothing. It isn't that suddenly I'm wasting my time. In being with that human being, I am giving to him or her something which is absolutely without price. There's something of myself and they are giving me something of themselves. And there's an interchange which goes on between the two of us. So as the person said to Sicily, they never let you down, they just keep coming. And then of course from uh, Consider Him, one of the later pieces of work that um, Cicely wrote, um, uh, she recognised that St Christopher's was the influence on, uh, of many people on Sicily. Um, she drew together some incredible people uh, in creating St Christopher's. I think she came from a background of upper middle class Britishness, which meant that she had the social connections to be able to move easily in society. The sort of person that actually you envy somehow because they seem so confident and quite so um, at ease with themselves. Although as she writes about herself, she would say she was anything but. Um, but she was able to feel, find in people men and women who were just somehow able to offer a, an insight or a word that would help. And so she brought onto the, um, early, uh, into the early stages of planning of the hospice someone called Olive Wyan, who became an ecumenical theologian. She um, drew in Bishop Edward Lunt, who had been a bishop of Stepney, who became the spiritual director for the hospice. And um, along with others, doctors, and people from uh, on, the, on the edges of government and policy. She began to work with them to decide what St. Christopher's was going to be like. She didn't do it entirely on her own. She had the vision and she was developing the model and the philosophy of the model, but these people helped her do that. They enabled her to do it by challenging her and reflecting back and helping her think about what St. Christopher's could be. It was very important that um, Anthony Mishnovich was remembered um, because he talked about this thing of I only want what is right. And that was key for Sicily. Um, Barbara Galton, who worked at King's College Hospital, was someone who influenced her enormously. And a woman called Louis, uh, who was a patient at St. Joseph's, was instrumental again in helping her think through what St. Christopher's should be like. Um, the name for St. Christopher's was given to, to Sicily by another patient called Mrs. G. She talked to this lady, Mrs. G, about what St. Christopher's was going to be, and she said, so Mrs. G asked her, what will this place be like? And Cicely Saunders said, it will be a place for travellers. And therefore, Mrs. G said, you ought to call it St. Christopher's then. Uh, because at that time, St. Christopher's was, was still a well-known saint in the panoply of saints in the UK. Although now... For most people, St. Christopher is just a little man on a, um, on a, um, on a medal worn around the neck for lots of people. 
um, he doesn't have quite the same um, significance. But many, many people, as Cicely reflected back on her life, came to help her understand what hospice was. And so, so the whole of Watch With Me is not simply a number of lectures that were delivered in isolation. They were lectures that were delivered having brought together all the education, all the learning, all the influences that had sat through her life for uh, 40 or 50 years and distilling them down and then finally putting them into print in Watch With Me. And that's uh, the book which you're going to launch today. And so to move back to some of our opportunities and challenges, and then I hope we'll have a few minutes for a question or two if you'd like. Um, and I want to mention something else at the very end, uh, which you might like to join. Um, we are now moving towards a very different model, uh, expanding our model. So we're beginning to think about and are delivering social care into the community, trying to join up social care, carers going into the home three or four times a day with palliative care. And we have one particular piece of work which is set in the southern part of our catchment area, which um, involves us, uh, a member of our staff, working in a hospital to identify elderly patients who really should be at home and not in hospital, who would benefit from some social support for six to eight weeks from us, and then either coming on to our books as, as patients or being directed to the appropriate place for, for their care. So trying to join up social and palliative care together because the two are so dis disparate in the UK. Healthcare and social care do not talk to each other at all. And so it's a real muddle. It's a complete muddle. And the money that's available for social care is very uh, difficult to access. It's not available to many people. And for most people, uh, social care or going into long-term care means having to sell your house and give up all your money. It's very difficult. Um, we uh, are doing work with care homes, um, which began after the development of the gold standards framework, which was in intended to improve the end of life care for people who were living in care homes. And what was recognised was that men and women who lived in care homes, when they came towards the end of their life, as they began to die, care home staff were ringing for an ambulance to take them off to hospital because they didn't want somebody to die in their care home because it reflected badly on them, or so they thought. And so the work that we've done through the Gold Standards Framework and now with um, an ECHO community is to enable staff in care homes to have the skills to look after someone who lives in a care home or a residential home to the end of their life. Because it's their home. They don't want to move anywhere else. It's where they live. And um, we're skilling them to use uh, crisis medications or end-of-life medications to offer social and emotional support and spiritual support and find ways in which Hot, uh, care homes can um, somehow uh, develop, role, develop a, a particular model that works for them uh, at the end of life. And the Namaste project, which uh, is uh, really taking off for us, which is about supporting people who live in care homes with dementia. Uh, it's an increasing um, uh, disease in the UK. Uh, people living longer are much more likely to develop dementia. The older you are, the more likely you are to be diagnosed with it. Um, and it's um, a service that we want to offer broadly so that Namaste, which is honouring the spirit within, is a way of meeting people not with medicine or with nursing, but simply with attentive care. And that might be through hand massage, it might be through spending time with somebody, it might be through listening to music together or looking at photographs or pictures. But it is that way in which we engage with men and women at a level which they've never been engaged with for a long, long time. But Namaste Care is all about helping people to understand uh, that their spirit within still, spurns, still burns even as life comes to its end. Because we very often treat somebody who is dying or who is no longer able to earn a wage or um, be productive as not of, not of much benefit to society. And Namaste Project is intended entirely to overcome that. So, finally, in terms of where we are now, um, spiritual and religious support, of course, has changed enormously since 1967. The, the way in which uh, the United Kingdom is, is made up, as I'm sure you experience across Europe as a whole, has changed. We are much more multicultural, much more multi-faith, much more secular in our understanding of the world. So we're now delivering uh, spiritual and religious support into a society which doesn't have a lot of uh, formal religious perspectives. There isn't a common language available as there was before. 
So finding language or terms that we can understand each other with is not as easy as it was. But there is always a desire for people to have something to alleviate their existential concerns through speech, through art, through music, through support of one way or another. Um, and I'm always amazed that people who have no religious affiliation whatsoever, as they come to the end of life, are very keen to see the chaplain who wears a clerical collar, a little piece of plastic slipped inside the collar, because there's something about the relationship they want to form with that individual, which means I can trust you to say anything I can now, and you will hear me, and you won't judge me, you will just listen and respond. And in spiritual care, as um, a sister said earlier today, it is the discussion of issues surrounding meaning, of disease, of change, of self. It is thinking about what am I worth now? Who will remember me? What value do I have? It's lots of things which are absolutely fundamental to us as human beings. It's not so much about what can you do for me to make me well, it's what can you do for me to hear my story? What is there about me that you will listen to? And, of course, we still offer religious care in, uh, in its pastoral form, in its, um, uh, through prayer and through sacraments, through the things that you would expect religiously to happen. Um, and some of those, for people who want to reconnect with a religious faith that they haven't had for many years, um, it can be an enormously beneficial thing for men and women who want to um, suddenly have a sense of reconnection or renewing a faith and understanding that where they are with their faith doesn't need to be sophisticated it doesn't need to be um, uh, very very deep it just needs to be present and supportive something which gives a sense of another the otherness the transcendent in life if you like that which is above me which I cannot understand but is present and known to, and and around me so in conclusion to allow a few minutes for questions I'd just like to invite you to uh, if you'd like to to join something and it's free to join uh, there is no fee. Recently, um, David Clark, who is based at the University of Glasgow, together with St Christopher's Hospice, with myself and Heather Richardson, and one or two others, um, have formed um, an organisation called the Sicily Saunders Society. And the aim of the society is to promote Sicily and her life and her writings and her works, and to um, uh, offer modern perspectives on her teaching, and our, on her writing and on her work. So we aim over the course of the next 12 to 18 months to begin to develop um, uh, um, uh, opportunities to come together for conferences and meetings so that we can understand um, more about Cicely and her work um, as an individual. So we have a Twitter uh, page, for those of you that are on Twitter, which is at CS Society. So it's the ampersand at CS Society. Now, if you all join this afternoon, my Twitter feed will go nuts because I look after it. So I will just get lots and lots of people joining at Sales City Saunders Society, which is great. So if you do, please join it. If you would like to be added to our mailing list and our information list, our email address is CS Society at stchristophers.org.uk. So that's CS Society, without any punctuation, at St. Christopher's, S-T-C-H-R-I-S-T-O-P-H-E-R-S, -S -E with no punctuation, dot O-R-G dot U-K. I'll have to write it down, probably, won't I? I think that's what I'll do at the end. But I'll write it down, or you can find me and I'll tell you. Um, but we would be really pleased if you'd like to join. Um, we are looking to plan an event in April, which probably was too um, soon for you, which is based around the archives of Cicely Saunders that are held at King's College. But then later in the year, when we open a new learning hub at St Christopher's, we plan to run an event at St Christopher's um, around the Cicely Saunders Society. And because it's a brand new building that we're opening, we will have um, a multi, um, uh, some some. Um, modern equipment which will enable people to zoom in or um, to, to sort of be present but not be present uh, from a distance if that's possible to join us for the conference. We have a moment or two for a question I think. Is there anyone who would like to ask about anything I've said? The 
referenca si je povabil k vprašanjem, če želi bilo kakršno koli misel izraziti, kar koli vprašati, lahko seveda v slovenščini. Ali se... Ali se vaši pacijenti odločajo kdaj za eutanazijo? Now that, that's, that's, that's a question. <laughs> yes. Would you like a one word answer? The answer is yes. Um, we have patients who will talk about euthanasia, uh, some who will actively plan to go to Switzerland. Uh, we have had some who have gone to Switzerland. Uh, so there, there are a number of responses to that. One is that we would talk as an organization about good palliative care being a way in which you don't need to find that sort of conclusion to life because we can support you to the end of your life. Um, um, but for others, of course, that doesn't make any difference and the need is still to do it. And I think that relates around suffering. I think you mentioned suffering in your uh, talk today, that I think for some people unbearable suffering is so huge that the idea of being able to afford to go to Switzerland is, is a, a way of alleviating that suffering. The reality is that for those that go, it's a very tiny number because you need to be able to afford to do it. We're not in a rich area of London. Most of our patients are not wealthy and therefore they don't have that luxury to do it. So I think the engagement around end of life and thinking about why do you want to end your life is a really important conversation to have because there's something about value and purpose in the midst of disease. There's something, as I said before, about legacy and what would you want to leave behind. There are conversations to be had, not to, which don't mean that you, you dismiss somebody who clearly is asking a difficult and important question, but you enable them to, to engage at a different level with it and then allow them to live with it. They still have the right to go to Switzerland if they wish. We can't stop them, uh, but we can't help them in any way. <laughs>